Hello, welcome to the Aaron Shores channel. This morning I want to talk to you about electric vehicle pack technology. In 2011, when the Nissan Leaf was commercialized, it used a lithium manganese spinel laminate battery pack that was optimized for cost reduction. When I'm talking about cost reduction, I'm talking about a production cost for the 24 kilowatt hour battery pack for less than $5,000. That meant that the Nissan Versa, which shares the same platform as the Leaf, could be mass produced using stamped steel technology that was cost optimized for the Versa with a little more sound insulation and dampening and refinement in the Leaf, while the gasoline, oh, gasoline internal combustion motor and transmission of the Versa, the CBT, which is in very good quality, was replaced with the EM57 electric motor with single reduction gear drivetrain and that electric motor can last a million miles or more. The battery pack, unfortunately, suffers from degradation over time. It's an air-cooled LiPo pack assembly, and they're in aluminum modules that are stacked in the rear of the car. Though Nissan improved the chemistry of these manganese spinel batteries and increased capacity from 24 kilowatt hours for the 2011 through 2014 model to 30 kilowatt hours in 2015. And then when they launched the second gen Leaf in 2018 for the 18 through 20, 23 models, they increased the base capacity to 40 kilowatt hours using a similar pack design and offer an E plus model in the SL variant or fully loaded uh, variation of 60 to 62 kilowatt hours depending on which model year. Now, you're looking at an improvement from worst case range with the original Nissan LEAF with the 24 kilowatt hour battery in the winter with the HVAC heating at 90 degrees and the heated steering wheel and heated seats turned on and the stereo on and all the lights turned on and absolute worst case uh, range of around 70 miles. That was improved to around 100 miles worst case with the 30 kilowatt hour pack and do 150 miles with the 40 kilowatt hour pack. Now those are worst case, you know, highway at 70 miles per hour in winter, all the functions and heating turned on cases. In reality, um, you're looking at uh, something like the 30 kilowatt hour battery going 85 miles, the 40 kilowatt hour battery going 100 miles, and the 60 kilowatt hour battery going maybe 160 miles. That's worst case. That's at less than three miles per kilowatt hour, which is a very low energy economy. Um, in most locales worldwide, it's possible to get 3.3 to 5.1 miles per kilowatt hour in the slightly lighter Nissan SV, and maybe slightly less than that in the SL because it weighs 400 pounds more due to the larger battery pack and all the added features and functions. I purchased a 2019 used Nissan Leaf uh, SV base model with cloth interior, no heated seats, no heated steering wheel. It does have the navigation package and a premium sound system, which is fantastic. And I'm using that to go 10 miles one way from my apartment in Issaquah, Washington to downtown Bellevue, where I work for the Bellevue School District as a bus driver. Now I frequently, after doing my AM route, return home and drive another 10 miles and then do cleaning, organizing, write blog postings, make YouTube videos, and then go back for the PM route or field trips. And so I'm driving about 40 miles per day. And the realistic range driven with some light hypermiling, that means energy efficient driving techniques, I'm able to obtain 3.5 to 5.3 miles per kilowatt hour. And there happens to be Nissan dealers nearby that have free L3 or level three charging at up to 45 kilowatts, though it tapers down to as low as nine kilowatts as you get up towards 80%. And what I do is I leave 15 minutes early, so around 5.45 a.m. I leave for work and five minutes later, I arrive at the local Nissan dealer in South Bellevue and I plug in the Chadmo DC charger from the ABB charger at the front of the dealership and I charge for between five and 15 minutes. 
and then I drive for another 10 minutes from there to get to downtown Bellevue. And depending on what the state of charge was when I stopped and what my actual driving will be later in the day, sometimes I charge for another 10 minutes on the way home. And what this is do doing is generally boosting me from around 60%, which is the average SOC I'm aiming for, up to around 70 to 77 to 80 or 82 or 83. And I generally speaking do not exceed 83% state of charge. And this is under the principal engineering model mode for a single cell lithium ion battery called the 4.11 volts DC cutoff voltage. While 100% charging will drag the lithium ion cell up to 4.26 or 4.35 volts VDC, charging to 100% causes an irreversible loss of lithium in the graphite or hard carbon anode material via a process known as intercalation. So the lithium ions get stuck between the carbon molecules. That's why overcharging your phone causes the battery capacity to fade. And I'm talking about your smartphone or your smartwatch. If you regularly go to 100% by leaving it on the charger all night, what will happen is the capacity will fade over two or three years. Now the lithium cobalt oxide battery that they're using in your smartphone was chosen for peak energy efficiency or energy density because a small mobile package needs absolute highest energy density, but they traded off durability. And notably, the controller allows the battery to overcharge and weaken the battery because smartphone makers, <clears throat> Apple and Samsung, found in doing market research that the number one reason that people upgrade their smartphone today in 2023 is because their older smartphone has a weak battery, though it does everything else they need it to do, excluding someone like me who's doing photography and videography. Their smartphone from 2017 does everything that their 2023 iPhone 14 does. Maybe it doesn't have an OLED screen and the cameras aren't that great, or maybe it's not quite as snappy or it doesn't play games as fast, the GPU's not as fast, but really the sizzle feature that sells newer phones is longer battery life per charge. And that's the number one reason people upgrade their smartphone. Well, guess what's happening in the electric vehicle space? People are upgrading away from the Nissan Leaf's 40 kilowatt hour and 62 kilowatt hour battery pack to EVs that have 80 or 100 kilowatt hours. And I'm talking about those from Hyundai and Kia and Tesla, but those are luxury segment vehicles at much higher price points than the $40,000 out the door Nissan Leaf or the $45,000 fully loaded Nissan Leaf SLE Plus. Those are economy affordable hatchbacks that have good energy economy using an air-cooled battery technology that won the Nissan Leaf the 2011 World Car of the Year Award. Because back in 2011, if you wanted an electric vehicle, you had to get a Nissan Leaf. And that deficit in the air-cooled battery technology is analogous to earlier air-cooled car engines that don't have the same kind of performance as liquid-cooled internal combustion engines present in most modern cars, especially turbocharged two-liter engines that are vastly overutilized by most automakers. Now, I have to give most automakers credit, though. They are doing EV technology. In fact, there's more than 600 electric vehicle models launching over the next few years from most of the world's automakers. And what you're going to see happen is that 250 miles of range per charge, 300 miles of charge, 350, 500, 600, and 1,000 miles. And the level three DC fast charging is gonna go from 500 volts at 100 to 350,000 watts to 800 volts at up to 1,000 amps or a megawatt of power. We might as well call that level four charging because at some point you're going to be able to pick up more than 100 miles of range in less than 10 minutes of charging. That's not going to be something you can have at your home. In fact, an L3 charger is hard to have at your home because it has to be hooked up to 277 or 480 volt three phase. And most homes don't have that on their 200 amp, 240 volt, two leg, 120 volt electrical panel. And neither does the apartment that I'm shooting this video in. In fact, what I'm doing right now is on the deck outside, I've got the EVSC level one charger plugged into a standard outlet running across the deck to the parking lot, plugged into the front of leaf. And what I'm doing, because it's a loner, is I'm actually polished trickle charging it more fully because we're going to be going to church in Monroe, which is more than 40 miles one way from this location. 
So that's gonna really stretch the battery packs depletion rate at highway speeds to keep up with traffic, though there's not as much on Sunday. We may run some other errands too, so I want to have additional battery capacity. And I don't regularly charge to 100%, and I would guard against that. Though once a month or every 500 hours, it's okay to give a saturation charge and to actually fully cycle from 10% to 95% or something like that. If you keep your lithium ion batteries from 30 to 80% by never fully discharging them and never fully charging them, they can last up to five times longer, and in some cases, 10 or 20 times longer. And remember, not all lithium ion batteries are the same. There's a variant called LFP or lithium iron phosphate that Tesla uses in the Chinese market model Y, and it has a 20 year shelf life and cycle life and up to 3000 full discharge cycles before it loses a substantial amount of its charge holding capacity. Now, the reason they use the LFP battery in the Chinese market and the N, uh, NMC battery in the US market, Tesla Model Y, stems from a difference in the charging infrastructure. So in China, they have more brownouts and power outages from their coal power system because the CCP prioritizes power flow to factories and fez zones that are producing goods for, export, for their export-based economy. A lot of the world's goods, including the iPhone that I'm shooting this on, are made in China by Foxconn or Hanhai Precision in this case. But the Chinese economy has flourished since 1980, largely based off of a manufacturing sector. The Chinese government created these manufacturing plants in what are called fezes or free economic zones, where no tax zones. So when you hear diplomats in the US or Europe talking about currency manipulation, what they're actually talking about is generous tax breaks, not just a tax break, a complete tax abatement. These factories that are in these Fed zones pay no income tax to the Chinese government, none whatsoever. And the planned economy from the communist government was replaced by free market reforms after Deng Xiaoping took power. So what you see in China is an economic hybrid model where they're importing the best ideas of competition from the West and free market reforms with the communist planned economy and, and central Chinese Politburo controlling the media and the news and everything else in China. And so there's a transition happening. And I want to point out the fact that I had excellent experiences with almost all Chinese people that I've encountered, including people that have moved to America from China. And I love the Chinese tea culture and the food culture there. And I actually like the country of China. I just don't like the CCP because of what they're doing in Hong Kong and on the island of Formosa or what is now known as Taiwan. Now, I'm not being critical of the Chinese government. I'm just saying they're guilty of engaging in the Tiananmen Square incident that I saw on TV as a child. And I don't like that. I don't like when the government moves the military in and kills unarmed college students. That seems maniacal and evil to me, though you can leave a comment below if you have a differing opinion. I don't want to say that I hate the country of China. I just hate the government, the CCP. But I'm not a big fan of the government in the US because the senators and Congress people here are engaged in all kinds of bribery and collusion with large corporations, including especially pharmaceutical companies that sell toxic drugs to people like fentanyl and prescription methamphetamine to people with narcolepsy, even though it's a huge drug of abuse. The pharmaceutical sector in America runs weird banner ads, and you can listen to the side effects. A lot of them are worse than the conditions they treat. And then they send the representative, the vendor, to the doctor, and the doctor becomes nothing more than a poorly educated pill pusher for selling products they don't really know much about to patients for whom they know even less about. And that's unusual. Read the, read the bottle on Tylenol, a, a Tylenol bottle, or read ibuprofen bottle, the side effects. Some people are going to take in and experience liver failure or drop dead of mitral valve failure of their heart because they have a rare genetic disorder or, dis or some gene defect that makes them highly allergic to these therapeutic compounds which are broadly beneficial to most other people. So the FDA's ruling on that is that if the ADR rate for a fatal adverse reaction affects less than 1 in 10 million people and it benefits the other 9,999,000 9 and so forth, then if 99.99% not, if of the people benefit and only a fraction of 1% have a problem, then the market, uh, the market is legal to sell those drugs to the public. They make it legal to sell those drugs because the thing is, there's people that are allergic to peanuts. Most people can eat peanuts, which aren't actually a nut, they're a legume. 
And that doesn't mean we should outlaw peanuts because a few people are allergic to them. And you have to ask yourself, why are there so many peanut allergies now? Maybe the peanuts are GMO and they contain proteins that are not natural, that were designed to ward off pests that affect agriculture. Maybe the agriculture has changed in America because large mega corporations like Monsanto bought up most of the family farms and they're spraying weird compounds that most people can't pronounce and doing science that most people don't know about that has questionable effects on health that I'm not here to, I'm not, I'm not here to claim, I know. But I don't think recombinated bovine growth hormone is good to give to young girls, for example, because it may have a detrimental effect on their endocrine system or their hormonal balance. And certainly there is a difference between cows treated with RBST and those without, otherwise they wouldn't spend all the money on the RBST. And you gotta ask yourself if the high technology conventional agriculture produces milk that's cheaper than the organic natural varietal, how can they put so much extra technology and offer a product that's cheaper? Well, it's the same thing you see with the automakers. They mass produce internal combustion engines by the billion. And they're old recycled designs that have been optimized for over a hundred years. Where a few automakers started to innovate, especially Nissan, in the electric vehicle space 57 years ago in Nissan's case, and they're, they're offering you more value. You know, Tesla, and I, I'm not big on saying this because the Tesla are more expensive to buy, more expensive to insure, more expensive to own and operate. Their tires and wheels are more expensive, especially if you get a puncture or a blowout. If you get into an accident, the sheet metal, the paint, they use water-based paint, it rubs off, it's not as durable. They have gap and quality seam problems. They are designed and made in America, and as an American, I appreciate that, but they're also a luxury segment vehicle that I wouldn't want to be seen in personally. I don't like associating with that kind of thing. And I don't want to be seen driving a luxury vehicle, especially not a Tesla. No, no judgment for people who do. I like Tesla. In fact, I've been promoting electric vehicles since 2009 online, starting on Facebook and then Twitter uh, and YouTube. And that's what this video is about. Ultimately, I'm sorry for going off on a tangent, but the scope of this video is encompassing some related global problems. Now, anybody that claims that an electric vehicle is green is partially incorrect. So the thing is, energy operating costs dominate the life cycle carbon footprint of a passenger automobile. So um, the purchase price of an automobile, a gas powered one, tells you very little about the long-term operating costs because there's belts, hoses, spark plugs, oil changes, and, and so forth, right? And the transmission can go out and cost $7,000 to replace. And these um, modern cars have more engine sensors and I mean, they're, they're very analogous to an electric car in terms of numbers of computer chips on board. In fact, with the chip shortage, because of COVID-19, the global chip shortage actually caused the automakers to stop production test, or um, Toyota was one of the only uh, car makers to continue making cars during the COVID shortages because they kept a, a, a large inventory of chips uh, used in manufacturing their automobiles. Where most of the other automakers run what's called a thin supply chain to keep overhead uh, holding costs low. So that it's called thin supply chain management and that's designed to maximize profit. So in shareholder focused corporations that are trying to optimize profit every quarter to maximize profit, they found with computerized logistics to keep the minimum amount of inventory maximized profit. But the problem is it has no resiliency. So when a corporation is operated like that, if there's a supply chain disruption, then the whole production comes to a stop, especially if it's a critical component that they can't source from an alternative supplier. So that's something to consider. Now I wanna talk about the electric vehicle battery pack because there's, these are some serious issues with cobalt and lithium mining, but there's also a lot of copper and nickel and aluminum in an EV battery. And all of those things are highly recyclable. So take the 2011 24 kilowatt hour battery pack in the original Nissan Leaf. After 10 years in service, they're faded and they maybe only hold 16 kilowatt hours of battery, but it still has a value for stationary applications, for grid energy storage, for rooftop solar energy systems and for wind power. Because when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing does not necessarily match when you're applying electrical loads. Significantly, when people get home from work in the evening or get home from school, they start turning things on. TVs, laptops, computers, lighting, start using their washer and dryer, their appliances, the fridge, the microwave, the oven, and so forth. They're not doing that while they're away. So there's actually a morning peak in loads 
and then evening peak in loads, and then lots of off-peak nighttime electricity available to charge electric vehicles that are parked for 90% of the time. Now these, these battery packs in electric vehicles can, can be recycled. When gasoline is burned, it makes air pollutants like CO2, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and hydrocarbon fumes, which are toxic to human brain and kidney cells. And the problem with privately owned vehicles is they're, when they start up, they're cold, right? They're not, they're not already at 186 degrees. They're typically at the ambient temperature uh, or the garage temperature, which is way lower than that. And so the engine has to burn very rich to heat off the catalytic converter because these emission control vehicles, they use extra fuel on cold start. And so they're getting terrible fuel economy. Think of an ICE vehicle that's sitting, that's idling. It's actually getting negative fuel economy because it's burning fuel and not moving. So where an electric vehicle like the Nissan LEAF really shines in short distance commutes from your home to the grocery store or to school or to a short distance commute to work, that's where gasoline vehicle in city use cases has the worst fuel economy, much lower than the EPA rating for fuel economy for that model year vehicle. So not only is gasoline and diesel a one-way combustion problem to climate change and air pollution, but electric vehicles used around urban locales and big cities and mega cities in suburbs connecting to other suburban cities, EVs are a superior solution for most drivers. They're not the all end all for everyone, but I am proving here on a ground floor uh, apartment complex and many ground floor condominiums that you have an outdoor outlet on the deck and you can plug in a 10-3 or 12-3 extension cord to your EVSE and then the EVSE into the front or side or back wherever your charging plug is on your electric vehicle. And if it's parked from 6 p.m. till 5 a.m. or 12 or 13 hours, you're picking up between two and five miles of charging per hour on level one at 1 1.6 kilowatts or 1600 watts. That's enough to cover the commuting range for many people. For example, during 13 hours of L1 charging, I can pick up 73 miles of range for my Nissan LEAF. And that costs about $3.33 worth of electricity at 16 cents per kilowatt hour. So this results in an operating cost, electrical operating cost per mile of 0.456 or about 5 cents a mile if I charge using the electricity that I'm buying from PSE, the utility company, for 16 cents a kilowatt. Now I know that the base rate is less than that, but this apartment uses more than 596 kilowatt hours uh, for hot water. It's all electric. We don't have natural gas, so everything's electric. Um, though my mother died recently and she was a conspicuous user of energy. So we've lowered the thermostat and we use less hot water and less resources. So I'm expecting a substantial reduction in our PSE bill. Last month, for example, we paid $267 for 1,956 kilowatt hours the energy use for the prior month. And that was with a little bit of electric vehicle charging on my 19 leaf, but mostly block heating of the 2005 Toyota Prius. So I've been block heating the, the Toyota Prius with three, 350 watt block heater since about 2007. And the goal with the block heater in very cold locales like Northern Canada is to prevent the block from freezing because you can't start an engine that's frozen cold. The aluminum's all constricted and the pistons can't move. And the benefit of block heating at moderate temperatures when it's 44 outside, you heat the block to 105, is that it radically reduces cold start um, emissions and, and, and saves fuel. So preheating with one kilowatt hour of electricity saves more than two cups of gasoline in a combustion in most cars because they can get to the full operating mode faster. That also enables the car to warm up faster so you can start getting heat out of the HVAC system during winter spring and fall when it's cold in the morning much quicker if you use a block heater. And there's enough nighttime off-peak electricity to block heat billions and billions of electric vehicles with a 350 watt block heater. Not quite as many um, for level two charging overnight, uh, but a lot of the EVSCs included with an EV are only 1.6 kilowatts or, or 1600 watts. So a standard electrical outlet, like the one that you would plug your vacuum cleaner into, um, can actually charge your electric vehicle as long as you don't exceed 1875 watts on that breaker circuit. So there's still a little headroom for an LED lamp or an LED TV or some other energy efficient appliance on the same circuit. Well, that's, uh, that about wraps it up for this episode. Thanks again for watching. If you have any comments about battery electric vehicles, please leave them below. And if you'd be so kind, please consider subscribing to my channel. Cheers. And in ham radio terms, 73.